So all of a sudden we were open. We weren't even, you know, a week away from opening. We were open. The show was open. The audiences were coming. And we had to scrap act two. Six weeks of rehearsals down the drain and go, okay, let's figure this out. So all of a sudden, bit by bit, we were building act two. And one of the things that happened was we, um, they wrote this end routine uh, to finish the show. And it involved a couple of things that magically I had never done before. And they said, well, we want to we wanna get this done. Well, obviously, as much time as you need. But also, we need a show. So I went on stage the next day, having learned about 15 pages of script for this whole routine, this last wow. section routine. That's sort of all right, because I can waffle around that. That's my happy place. But magically, there was stuff I was scared of. I was mm. genuinely scared because it would be like saying to someone, go and do a, a, a Finding the Aces routine that you have never done before, but do it in front of a thousand people. And you haven't learnt, ever learned how to do that before the day before you're going on to do it. And welcome to another episode of Desert Island Tricks. We've got a live in-person recording, which actually hasn't happened that m many times. Now, today's guest, uh, you would have seen the title. I know at this point you've seen the title. Um, so you're going to know a little bit about this guest already. He has literally burst onto the magic scene over the past, I would say, half a year, year. And from what's coming up there is going to be a lot of this person everywhere. He's got some incredible tricks already out with the 1914. We've got a very special live recording with him. And at the point of you listening to this, not at the time of recording, there is also a course by this person. Um, because he's here, normally I wouldn't do this, but I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about his past and his career and why we're very thrilled to have a certain course on Unlimited today. Today's guest is the incredible Simon Lipkin. Hey! Yay! Hey. I clapped myself. That's what happened there. <laughs> I clapped myself. That's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> so Hello. it's good to have you here, and it's nice to be doing it in person as well. Yeah, it's much nicer to have a conversation in person. Absolutely. Now, the guys, if they haven't met you... Yeah. Um, I actually accidentally met Simon when I was 16, 18. Yeah, don't pause too much, it's getting weird. <laughs> um, because Simon was in one of my favourite musicals of all time, which was called Avenue Q. Good show, good show, it, isn't it? It was phenomenal. What a phenomenal show. Um, and actually, in the original recording, I actually showed Simon that I've got his original program That's from right. that show you still had a program from i the... still have it with you in it i mm. was 20 years old i was 20 years old when we did that um and now i am almost what's the word dead so <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah that was a long time ago but that was my first leading role in the west well my second leader but my first big huge original west end cast leading role at 20 years old uh, for Cameron Macintosh back in 2006. And in sort of a full circle moment, I've just started, well, for the first time since I worked for him then, I've just, we're in rehearsals for Oliver right now. We're not, this is a few weeks before, but when you <laughs> listen to it, I'll be in rehearsal. So I, I was trying to be professional, like a normal, <laughs> a normal publicity person, but Jamie hasn't got a clue what he's doing. <laughs> so Don't tell them that, they don't so, need to know. Yeah, so as of when you're listening to this, I'm in rehearsals for Oliver with Cameron McIntosh to play Fagin in the brand new production. It's going really well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, we will be going to see that one as well. And for you guys, so... Um, Simon is actually, as well as a magician and primarily mentalist, I would argue. Yeah, probably. I mean, exclusively. I can't yeah. do any sleight of hand. I mean, oh. not a single piece of sleight of hand. Technically, 
one of the routines that you're teaching is sleight of hand. It's mentalism sleight of hand. In the, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in my live lecture, mm. which has already been out because we're filming It would have this. already been, yeah. You're terrible at this. <laughs> this is your podcast. <laughs> the, the, Sorry, guys. It would have been out like a couple of weeks already. It would have been, yeah. So not I'm going to be teaching that, uh, that I did you, teach. You taught. I want to start this again. <laughs> this is a car crash. It's unbelievable. You're making people listen I, to I this. I think they've worked out at this point. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Simon is actually an actor. Uh, recently, most recently, I saw Simon three times in um, Darren Brown's Unbelievable, yeah. which was phenomenal. And if I might say... You were definitely, for me at the very least, the standout performer in that oh, show. Oh, thank you. Um, you really much. carried a lot of the the themes and certainly the magic that you performed in that show. Yeah, it was really fun. I mean, what an incredible experience. So, yeah, I've, like you say, I've spent my life acting. That is my that's my day job. Which, ironically, for most actors, their day job is not acting. So. Um, uh, I've been so lucky and it's not I, I, I really say this with no sort of fake humility or anything like that it, it is I've been so lucky I, when I was young I got a lucky break and then it's a little bit like if you have to buy paint you just go to B&Q or Farron Ball because that's where you know sells paint that my career is basically backed off of I got a lucky break when I was young because I could do some weird voices and I just fit a job and no one better than me was available at that time and then that sort of gave me a career which is amazing and I'm 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 I'm, I'm so grateful for it and that has led all the way when I was little I was obsessed with just showman and variety I was obsessed with Sammy Davis Jr and Tommy Cooper and Morecambe and Wise and all of the Think all of the people that no other little 10 year old boy was obsessed with. I had no interest in football. I would just wanted to go, well, how do you transition from a song and dance into a magic trick and then some <laughs> juggling and an impression? Um, I was popular. And uh, so <laughs> I, I, I was obsessed with it. And magic was a huge thing that I was obsessed with when I was a kid. Um, and I did a lot of it and I learned a lot. And I got my first proper little taste of it when I, my secondary school was a performing arts school. I went to a place called the Sylvia Young Theatre School and it was in Marylebone. So I had to get on the tube every day in London and get on the tube for an hour and whatever every day and go to school by myself as a kid. And on the way back, I'd come through Charing Cross, which is where it's no longer there, sadly. Um, but it's where Davenport's was in the, in the underground there. And I used to, I used to get off the train on my way home from school and I would go into Davenport's and because I was working as a kid, as an actor, I had a little bit of money and, and like proper money. So I would get magic. Most people had like pocket money for normal stuff. I had like magic pocket money. So I would take a bit of money. I would go to Davenport's maybe once a week, once every other week. And I would just spend a little bit of time in there looking at tricks and buying new stuff. And, and then life happened and my, career I kind of focused on acting and moving forward in that direction and then I um I met this man who was completely unknown to me uh but was really nice we got on like a house on fire and he was uh, a brilliant actor and I respected him and we got on very well and he said he did a bit of magic and I was like oh well, that's exciting I do a bit of magic so I started showing him my slip force <laughs> and I started doing a one ahead routine and I was showing this to Andy Nyman and I, <laughs> and then I learned who Andy Nyman was and I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me whole because I had shown him what I thought was an incredibly deceptive double lift. <laughs> so uh, he, he, um, he introduced me properly back into the world. I'd always loved it, done bits, but... He took me to the magic circle for the first time and uh, he's sort of been my unknowing magic mentor through this whole thing. And I think we have very similar approaches. And when I say that, I mean, his brain is like, you, I can't even come close to the, his thinking. But in that terms of approaching mentalism from a very theatrical way, and I don't mean grandioso, I mean the intention of the move and knowing that the greatest form of misdirection is you and your storytelling and how you can make someone think or feel and actually the complicated method, which I know, I understand. I love toys. I love crazy methods. I love 
all of the work that goes into it. But actually when I'm working and when I'm performing, I want the simplest thing to get me from A to B that allows me to perform the hell out of it. And I really learned that from Andy. I really learned that from Andy. And so where I've waffled to, but I'm getting to, is this whole life of acting and the magic coming into my life, the magic circle. I'm honored to be a member of the inner magic circle. And it, this all kind of came together, sort of culminating in getting a call from um, Andy saying, we're doing this new Darren show. Do you fancy it? So all of a sudden, my whole life being on a West End stage and my other whole happy life, my hobby, my love of magic came together. And for a little while, I got to work with, I mean, undeniably, Darren is the greatest magical stage performer of our generation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know there are other incredible magicians. That does not mean that I think, it, but as a stage performer, I'd say that Darren is one of the best stage performers magical or not just best live performers that i've seen ever so to work with him and andy and andrew o'connor uh and and the other amazing surrounding team around that and get to put on a show was just a, a, an experience that i will never forget and loved with all of my heart so um, we didn't do the little preamble, so I'll do it now. Go For those on. of you who have only just tuned into this podcast and you've never been here before, the concept is that uh, we are about to travel to Simon's own desert island. Uh, when he goes to this desert island, he's only allowed to take eight tricks, one book, and one non-magic item that he uses for magic. He can't take anything else. Particulars, where the island is, who's on it, etc. It doesn't really matter. It's more about the ultimate list of tricks that Simon would take with him if he could only perform that for forever. So let's whisk you away to your desert island. What's in your first position? Um, I'm taking a peak wallet. That's what I'm taking. Uh, there's two options for this peak wallet uh, because it's the staple of, of, of a mentalist, isn't it? It's, it's so useful. You can do anything and everything. There is no limitation on what routine you have to do or how you have to do the thing or... You know, it is, it's a versatile, it's a versatile thing that I, I literally never leave the house without a peak wallet. I have two that I carry. I carry uh, a Orphic uh, wallet um, by Louis Levallon in 1914. And I also carry a warning, branding, stealth assassin <laughs> wallet uh, produced by, uh, what's the name of the company? What is it? You say it, Jamie. Alakazam. Alakazam. Um, so they're my two. They're my two. What is a choice? I love them. I think they're very good. I just think that there's something about a peak wallet that just is is fun. It's and there's I sort of I tire a little bit of the conversation of like, but what's the justification of writing it down, and putting it back in the peak wallet, said by someone carrying a an handkerchief that turns it into a cane. Like, <laughs> get in the bin. Like, look at my box. Look at my box trimmed with silver glitter. Like, but you've got a problem with writing something down and putting it in a wallet. All right. All right, mate. Uh, Oi, mate. Your stairs look deep. Like, <laughs> it, come on. Come on. It's all right. Everyone has a go at the mentalists. But it's funny, isn't it? It takes, it takes chutzpah. It takes hooks. I should. That's a that's the Yiddish word. It takes it takes it takes balls to to do a lot of mentalism and and so um, I don't know. I just a peak wallet is just p powerhouse for me. Absolute powerhouse. And if you use it in the right way, I think if you use it in a very sort of limited linear way of, can you write th this down or do, draw something and then put it in here and now immediately I'll tell you what it is, then th it's rubbish. But that's like anything. It's what we were talking about. It's what Andy's passionate about. It's what I'm passionate about. It's how do you take that and all of a sudden, all of a sudden use that and time misdirect and really justify those things because you can get anyone to do anything, right? I mean, look at us now to, to describe, you can't see us or can you, but the, it's, we sat in a room with a desk in between us with headphones on talking to microphones. If you showed that to anyone, we'd go, why are you doing that? We just are because that's the way it works. Mm. It's you're in charge of the process. You're in charge of the narrative. If you if you if you believe in the process of whatever's happening, then so will they. And you can justify anything. You can justify anything with good 
well thought out narrative. So first on my list, a peak wallet, please. Okay, I think that's a, a superb choice. Thank you. However, Go on. I'm going to be devil's advocate because right. this is what I've done to everyone who's mentioned a peak wallet. Yeah. Uh, when you go, you're only allowed to do one routine with your peak wallet. What is the routine that you would do with it? Uh, I would do... Am I specifically using one of those wallets? If those are your preferred ones, then yeah. Okay, then I would be doing... Uh, with my Orphic wallet, I would be doing a variation of... It's kind of like a, um, a name divination, their name, and a one-ahead routine with sort of... Their name ends up in a inside the wallet but i'm also getting other pieces of information it's it's just like a getting to know you kind of routine but it's a whole one ahead it's kind of based on ben williams's anything routine um there's forces and it's like a multi-phase routine just with one one peak wallet and a couple of bits of paper the uh ben williams is trick anything's superb it's a great it's a, it's a great trick and he's i really liked his version his original version mm. of it um, but I sort of did a version of it using using an Orphic wallet and built a whole kind of little routine off the back of that with a whole bunch of stuff in there. So, yeah, very fun. It's great. And um, both of those wallets, superb. I own both of them as well. Brilliant. I, I love Brilliant both of them wallets equally. For different they're, reasons. They're great. Yeah, it depends on the performance situation, but they both have very, very strong merits. Uh, but incredibly great first choice i think the fact that you can do so much with that as well yeah um is superb but that brings us on to your second item so what's in your second position this this is gonna catch you off guard mm. it's not mentalism it's a mm. trick that i just love doing okay all right do you want to guess it is it a coin trick mm, sort of but no it isn't a coin trick um but you could do it with a coin this is uh haribo by Lord Harry. I love this trick. It's right up my street. It's silly, but impressive. It leaves them talk. It's joyous, right? So for those of you that don't know, and I cannot, if you are a walk around magician, this trick, get it. It's so good. Um, you borrow a ring or a sign coin or, or whatever, but I would do it with a ring. And uh, you uh, you chat away for a little bit and that ring either vanishes or um, changes places with a little Haribo ring. And then you kind of say, well, if that's there, uh, I don't know where yours is. And you pull out a small packet of Haribo from a pocket or a back pocket or a jacket pocket or whatever. And sealed inside the little packet of Haribo is the borrowed ring. It is simple it is direct it is the method is easy and classic and brilliant and it's just joyous it's a joyous routine that brings fun to everyone also you need outs but you don't hear people talking about outs like if you're going to do a trick you should have an out just in case you know mm. maybe that can go awry well this has the best out ever they get sweets so yeah the, you do magic for them, they're amazed, and then you leave them with snacks. Mm. Like, come on. That covers all the bases. Yeah. But it's a brilliant trick. Go check it out, Lord Harry. He's got some really clever stuff, but that is my favourite of his. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. He's got a great what's three wor what three words trick, which I thought was a really interesting concept as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah very He's smart. great. And he's super lovely as well. Really very nice guy. lovely. Very lovely. Ex-Army. Yeah, I know. I have a friend of mine, actually, that does a version of that. Uh, when I was following him g gigging it, watching the response from the audience, it really does get tremendous response it's from people. It's brilliant. It's an object to an impossible location. It's fun. It's different. The transposition makes sense. Um, like, I've never loved ring flight, right? I've never just... I just... I think it's a brilliant trick. It's a brilliant trick, but it just doesn't connect with me. But the best version I ever saw of it was where someone sort of did what looked like uh, like a spellbound move, um, and it changed to a key. So they had the key in their hand, and then where the key should be, their ring was. So I really like that the um, the the ring, their borrowed ring, changes to a Haribo ring. That makes mm. a lot of sense to me. Um, so that's lovely. 
Uh, I just, yeah, it's fun. It's joyous. It makes people smile. I think if you're doing magic and it's, yeah, perfect. Perfect trick. It's like a, a, a non-spoken narrative, isn't it? You don't have to say anything. They exactly. just know straight away exactly what's that. happened. Exactly that. Um, great choice. But that brings us on to your third. What's in your third position? So this one's got a little story for me because this is, this is something very special. Um, the magic circle is genuinely very important to me. Uh, I, it, it, it makes me so happy and it really changed my life and I've made some incredible friends there and I just love it. So uh, the next on my list is a trick called Sterling, uh, which is uh, by uh, International Magic, Martin at International Magic. It's one of his creations. It is, I think, maybe £15. It's a £15 packet trick and it is the trick that got me into the magic circle. Uh, it is a self-worker. It is very simple, but oh my gosh, is it falling. It is a brilliant trick. So here's what happens. You give your spectator five coins, uh, 1p, 2p, 5p, 10p, 20p. And uh, they mix them up into, and it, you give them a prediction before you start. Uh, and uh, you, they mix those coins up into any order that they want. They can change their mind as much as they like. And then you, uh, a deck of cards that's been in play the whole time, you then say, okay, we're going to deal as many cards as there are pennies. So if there's one P, we'll deal one. If there's five P, then we'll deal five cards. So you just deal in whatever order they've put those cards, they put those coins in, deal the cards in front of them, get through however you want, look at the cards that you've stopped on, your prediction spot on every time. That sounds wicked. It's so baffling and fair and fooling. It's a great trick. Uh, Martin uh, McMillan has got, he's a brilliant thinker. I mean, um, International Magic is the last standing magic shop in London, I think. I think it's the last so, brick yeah. and mortar in London, yeah. And they, they're they lovely and it's a gorgeous shop to go into and it, it's it's really sweet. But Martin... Martin has some creations that are his that are just mind-blowingly good, you know? Mm. And they're not a big company. They're not a big thing. So they don't scream and shout about them and they don't have huge distribution and all of that sort of stuff. But if you're ever by there and you get a chance, go in there and just ask to see Martin's tricks and you you won't you won't regret it. He's a very, very smart man. So, yeah, for getting me into... I did other stuff as well. I didn't just do... I just didn't. I, I didn't just do that trick, uh, but um, yeah, that that it holds a very special place in my heart because it fooled a lot of people in the room, and so Sterling by Martin McMillan from International Magic is going on my list. Great. <clears throat> it's always nice when I do these lists when someone throws in one that is maybe not as well known. Yeah, no one will know that trick because it gives everyone the opportunity to go and check it out. I'll definitely be checking that one out. It sounds really good interesting it sounds like something as well i'm guessing it was great for upscaling to parlor oh yeah exactly that so mm. super easy super easy really lovely fair impossible in this world of in this world of making everything look impossible you know the the um i mean we can all uh, i'm sure a lot of us have done it i do it regularly get out your calculators let's look at the impossible this just feels a bit more sort of tangible because you you are holding these things. They are, this is a very impossible outcome from stuff that is just a little bit more sort of interactive and actually with you. So it's a nice alternative if you want to do something like that. It's, yeah, joyous trick. I think by looking at your choices so far, so far, I haven't seen what you've got coming. Very organic in the way that you think about things and, and do things. So we've got a peak wallet, yeah. something that you carry, Harry Bow. Normal everyday change that you have in your pocket for Sterling. Yeah, exactly that. So quite an organic approach to, to yeah, performing. Yeah, I really love stuff to come out of a situation. So actually, when I perform, I don't really have a, a, a sort of set that I do. I love to, I know um, that a lot of people will say, have a quick snappy opener that, that you can amaze them in 30 seconds and I think that is brilliant uh, and and sometimes I will do something like that but actually I really love to just talk to them and just get to know them and so um, maybe this is from my sort of acting uh, background but I do a lot of improv 
and there's just sort of this basic rule of acting, which is listen and respond. You sort of, you, I'm sure you've all heard that. Be in the moment, listen and respond. And often if you just have a, a conversation with people for just a minute or two and genuinely listen and respond, you will know exactly what magic to perform for that group, for the energy. You will know, okay, I don't need to perform at them. I can now perform with them because I know that this group, someone has said, we're celebrating a birthday. So now I can, with my pink bullet, go into a birthdays routine where I get other people's birthdays. And all of a sudden now this moment of magic feels completely connected to what we were talking about and feels a lot more magical because we did magic with their lives, with their situation, rather than me going, that's very interesting, now uh, any card at any number, or whatever, do you know what I mean? Like, everything is more, everything is more organic, and even if it isn't, even if it isn't organic, it should feel organic to them. I've still only got, whatever, five tricks in my pocket, I'm gonna do one of those five tricks, but I'm gonna listen and respond and look for the in to get to the position where it feels like that trick is just for them. We're having a conversation and I go, oh, of course then, let's try this and have this experience. And it should feel like that trick is tailor-made for them in that moment because of what we've been talking about. So it's less about the object being organic, it's more about the situation being organic, is what I care about. It's a very, that's a very Darren Brown approach as well. His whole um, ethos is it should always be about the audience member on stage it should be about their story it should be about their experience and yeah. never the performer themselves exactly that uh, exactly. well he says that in his early career it was about him but he quickly learned that that wasn't his style yeah um, and it's then it become about other people it's also less interesting and um there's sort of a trick to that which is weirdly if you make it about the other person you look better mm-hmm you, because if you are good, you're still the one doing the stuff and you will have plenty of time to have glory. But actually, if you give to others truly and generously, mm -hmm. then you look better. And that includes your audience. That it, like, even if you're in a close up situation, the more that you give to the other person that you are performing with, and I say with very deliberately and, and, and not to or at, you look better. Mm -hmm. So it is it is sort of a slightly self-serving um, technique to mm -hmm. make it all about the other person because because it, by doing that, you inherently achieve more as well. Yep, very, very true. Uh, and that swiftly brings us on to your halfway point. Thank you. Number four. Uh, so this, um, we're going to go to the Nyman catalogue. Um, we are going to take uh, Magician's Graphology is what we're going to take. So this is Andy Nyman's version of Sneak Thief by Larry Becker. So the original was all done in, I think a lot of people unknowingly call Magician's Graphology Sneak Thief because it, that's what it's based off. But the original Sneak Thief was all in wallets, these leather wallets, and you would do all of this stuff. It was a lot, it was a, a very prop heavy and process heavy. And Andy took this brilliant handling and got rid of all of that stuff with, um, with Larry's blessing and and consent and uh created magician's graphology which in my opinion is one of the strongest tricks as a mentalist you can do it's also fully scalable you can do this thing with some billets close up or you can get some big old bits of board and do this as a huge stage piece and i know many mentalists that do it's just brilliant and completely versatile so uh, the original plot is it? Should I talk everyone through the plots? I'm kind of yeah, doing yeah. That. You yeah. can talk through the plot. Yeah, so yeah. Um, the original plot is you have four bits of uh, four bits of card or whatever, and you would give them out to four different people, and you would say, "Draw something." Everyone draw something different. Put them face down and give them a mix up, so we don't know where anyone's is. And then uh, you pick up the top one from the pile, and you'd be able to then divine. Okay, this is. Uh, a picture of a cat and I think this belongs to person number three and then this is a picture of a house that's person number one this is a picture of a dog that's person number two and then you'd have one card left and you'd say now obviously this belongs to person number four it would be unimpressive if I just gave it back to you so let's try something different and then you can divine what that is sight unseen and replicate the drawing or tell them what they wrote down or any of those things it's a just it's it's 
just a brilliant routine that is fully, fully customizable to whatever that situation is. So again, like we were just talking about, it's something that I always am ready to do because mm -hmm. if we if we're talking and we get onto a subject matter of, I don't know, someone says, you look like budget Colin Farrell to me or whatever like that. And and then someone goes, oh yeah, Jane really fancies Colin. Uh, then we can go, all right, well let's uh, celebrity lookalikes. Okay, go for the random ones. And now all of a sudden this routine is about who, what celebrity do you look like? Mm -hmm. And then we can not make it obvious and we can get random or you can pick for each other or first kisses or tattoos that you, Tattoos that you've always wanted, or I do a close-up Q and A with Magician's Graphology, where people write down their questions, and I can tell who's asked what, and then answer the last question. You know, it's completely adaptable to any situation, and it's again, Nyman's brilliant thinking, which is simple, clean, easy to do, very bold, and but powerhouse. Mm -hmm. It's it I. I just can't, magician or mentalist, boy, oh boy, should you learn this trick. Yep. It's brilliant. It is, it's one of my favorite routines. And two, two thoughts on that, in that same vein. Go on. Um, Darren Brown's recent show. Yeah, Showman. Showman. The opening routine. Best version of Sneak Thief ever. Literally. But what I loved about that was they took the method and pushed it so much further mm. by enabling another set of revelation on the, on the end yeah, essentially yeah, yeah. it's so brilliant. it was phenomenal it's so brilliant it was it was so well constructed um and nyman has another version yeah which i literally love and i hope one day i get to perform it so it was in his li recent lecture notes yeah and it's with mobile phones with the mobile phones very good yeah that opening a show would be phenomenal. Yeah. It's the thought of having that bag and people putting their phones in. Yeah. Uh, what a great way to start a show. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. It's absolutely, it's, but that's what I mean. It, 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 it's a utility device. Mm. I think what I'm, apart, I mean, not all of it, you'll see the more and more we go. I love utility, devi utility devices. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what I create when I'm creating magic is what, I want to give you something that you can, I can come up with 10 ideas, but hopefully you'll come up with another five and that person mm -hmm. comes up with another this many. Like, I love giving people something where they can just go, well, this is adaptable to so many situations. And that I, I, I adore magic like that. Mm -hmm. Great choices. Uh, again, as Simon said, I can't put it any better than Simon. Do check out Nyman's Graphology. It's oh, just, it's, it's phenomenal. It's brilliant. Hello guys, I'm here to talk to you about Alakazam Unlimited. This is the best streaming platform in the world, I'm telling you now. With Alakazam Unlimited, you get access to over 150 magic routines. This is video performances and explanations. We have card magic, coin magic, kids magic, rope magic, mentalism, stage, parlor, impromptu, we've got you covered. All of this for the low price of just £4.99 a month and you can cancel at any time. Perfect if you've got commitment issues. Yes, I'm talking to you. Guys, you are gonna absolutely love it. If you haven't joined the platform already, what the heck are you doing? Alakazam Unlimited is a streaming platform that you need to be a part of. Not only that, there is also exclusive content only available on the platform. Check it out now, alakazam.co.uk. Cheers. Um, and that takes us over your halfway point to number five. Number five, I am going to take uh, PK Touches. A uh, huge fan of PK Touches and what you can do with them. And I uh, love exploring uh, what can be perceived to be happening. Um, so I really enjoy sort of the the uh, the sort of I guess most common version, which is you touch someone on the shoulder or the arm or the whatever, and the other person raises their hand and feels it, and that's great. But I really enjoy taking that mythology uh, and and seeing what else can be done with it. Uh, so recently, I started exploring the concept of 
um, like name revelations. If say, for example, if I have peaked uh, a, a piece of information or or a name of someone's loved one or or someone that they're close to or whatever, and started to look at, well, could I via PK touches then get the other person? to reveal that name letter by letter. So now all of a sudden I'm not revealing the name. I'm sort of getting a sense of stuff and drawing on this person's back. And the other person now letter by letter is revealing the name that that person has thought of. So taking PK touches and pushing them in a different direction and and using that, but also then just doing the sort of the well-known version of the routine because it's fucking great. Mm -hmm. It blows people away and it's so fun and... It excites me because it's it's just bold and ballsy and you have to really... It's all about you. There's nothing to rely on there. It's why I love pseudo-hypnotism and PK touches and I kind of bundle that all into one that it's just all about you and what you can get away with and how you can truly connect with someone and what can happen in that moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I listeners who have followed me throughout however many years now yeah. will know that that would certainly be on my list somewhere. Yeah. Um, because I love it. It's the the plot that I've explored the most yeah. in my entire career. Um, it's my thousandth, ten thousandth timer. I've done it quite literally 10,000 plus times. Wow. Um, I love it. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so 100%. Do you have... Go on. Do you have a favorite set? of influences maybe from different people or, or methods? Um, I sort of, you cherry pick, right? You, mm. you kind of go, well, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. Mm. I mean, I sat in one of my favorite ones that I have ever learned. Uh, I don't know whose it is, which is terrible, but um, Chris Cox taught me in an Italian restaurant. He went, have you ever seen this one? He doesn't <laughs> even do them. But he just went, have you ever seen this one? He did it. I was like, well, that's in. You just keep accumulating all of these different versions. So obviously, Pete Turner's got great work on it. Leon Manor has got great work on it. Banachek's got good work on it. Like, there's 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 lots of good stuff on it. Um, but this one, I'll I'll show it to you afterwards because I'm sure you'll know it. But it's a good one. <laughs> it's a really good one. I'm excited to see that. Yeah. I literally, I could s talk for hours on it. I yeah. love it. I think great. it's great. Uh, that takes us to your sixth. We're approaching um, towards the, the tail end. But again, not a lot has changed in terms of the organicness of, of, of it. I think it's great. Yeah. The thought that you could just rock up so far on, on your list rock up to any situation, yeah. look like you've got nothing on you, yeah. and then straight away go into these routines. When, when I gig, I basically turn up with a stack of billets and a wallet. Great. That's it. So that takes us to, what's your sixth item? Okay. <sighs> this, I'm, I'm struggling now because there's a lot, there's a lot that I wanted to put in. Um, so I'm going to go with... Okay, let me talk you through my process because I need help. So the next one was going to be a, a smash and stab routine. But here's the thing. I don't ever really perform them. I just love them. And also, I think the ending is disappointing. But I still love it. Mm -hmm. I really love it. And so I'm obsessed with creating close-up smash and stab situations that that end with something sort of vaguely interesting um so uh i showed jamie one of these mm -hmm. uh, the other week he liked it it was all right it was good more than liked it loved it yeah. uh, i i the first thing i asked simon at that point was where can i get it yeah because if it was available i would have bought probably two of them just to have a backup there and then yeah not not available yet not available yet. Not available. Maybe yet. soon in the future. Who, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> cryptic. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I love smash and stabs. I also I love credit card smashes. I love anything that um, adds a little bit of drama and jeopardy into the in, into the proceedings. So, uh, I've come up with a couple of credit card smashes because I really like them. I think that's very fun. I like a phone smash. I like any kind of roulette 
destructive natured uh, activities, mm -hmm. uh, magical or not. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I think I, sm I just really enjoy them. And also I think maybe it's ego because I'm desperate to solve the end of a smash and stab. Mm -hmm. um, because inherently, so we should talk about, again, I, I'm guessing we can't assume that everyone always knows what we're talking about. So yep, yep. Um, uh, smash and stab are the routines where there's like one spike on a block of wood and then you have, you know, you stick it in a bag and you have five other bags and you smack your hand down and then you've miraculously missed the spike. Or it's an egg or you stick someone's watch in a bag and smash them up or someone's phone or a credit card. It, any kind of roulette, you know, we'll, we'll guess until inevitably we get it right. And the problem with the trick is, even though it can go wrong and uh, uh, that that's never fun, or whether it be someone else's possessions or your safety, the ending is in their minds it's not going to go wrong. So the way that people that have gotten over that so far is to heighten the risk factor for yourself. So let's look at something like, uh, what's it called? Risk, is that what it's called? Uh, risk, which is with staple guns. You, you have one loaded staple gun and the rest are empty. Now that heightens the risk for the performer. So we up the drama in that moment, but ultimately we still end in the same way, which is safety, mm -hmm. right? And it is impressive. It's, it's a lot of fun. But it's how can you solve that ending of um, pushing towards something that happens at the end of a smash and stab routine that feels like it it ends it ends not just with inevitable success, and so a lot of people's thoughts towards that are maybe to just basically tag on a different magic trick on the end, which I think works, but I would say that that is fifty percent cop out because it's you know you take a, a whatever uh i've seen versions of it where someone prog progressively reveals a thought of piece of information through it and i actually think that's probably a really good idea it's the it's the best idea that i've sort of seen so far of putting yourself under pressure to, to the process the the sort of fake process being that by being under that amount of pressure you push yourself into that heightened state of thinking to divine that name. So that's quite good. I think that's quite interesting. But I just kind of love the plot. I love the drama of it. I love the theatricality of it. I mean, especially when you get those big ones on stage. I think I've seen like Aaron Crow doing it blindfolded while someone beats a drum. Like, it's so unnecessary. But I kind of just love them. I own so many of them. And I tell you this now, I have never performed a stage smash and stab ever. I own maybe 10. <laughs> Never performed a single one of them. Close up, I, I have done. In fact, my invisible deck routine is a smash and stab. Mm. So I, I, I end the invis the, this two bag smash and stab with the nail is through the invisible deck. So they select the card and do all of that sort of stuff. But again, it's all right, but it's a bit of a cop out ending. But mm -hmm. it's sort of, I mean, nothing can't be solved with an invisible deck, right? How do you end this invisible deck? Yeah, do that. Um, so smash and stab, that's it. Waffled too long on that. So that brings us on to number seven. What's in your seventh position? I've got two left, right? Yes. I've got two left. Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm going to pick, shall I pick one of my tricks or shall I pick something that's meaningful? Do the one that you love the most. So okay. if it's well, one then, of yours, then go for it. Then uh, join me on stage at the Criterion Theatre during Darren Brown's <laughs> Unbelievable because there was one moment every night that brought me so much joy. Uh, we, it was a very, it was just changing pocket, right? It was very simple. We were kind of doing this seancey spirit, celly kind of vibe routine at the end of the show, which culminated in this mental reveal. Um but one moment was, uh, the premise was someone was in a trance on stage and their astral form would leave their body and could travel anywhere in the auditorium. And so uh, I would have someone on stage and I would ask anyone who had any loose change on them to stand up. And then I would let that person on stage select anyone in the audience that they wanted to, completely free choice anywhere in the theatre. Uh, they would stay standing. I would ask them, do you know how much change they have uh, you have in your pocket? 
And they would say yes or no. I'd say, leave it there, don't count it. And at that point, um, the astral traveler on stage <laughs> would, uh, would slowly leave his body, travel out to the audience uh, in a trance state, write down the amount of change you'd just counted in that person's pocket. We'd put it in an envelope, we'd seal it, we'd give it to the spectator on stage to hold. We'd say, how much change did you have? Can you count it for me? They'd say, you know, one pound 78. Open the envelope, let's have a look. One pound 78. It was, it just, it was so dirty and mm. it made me so happy. Because also just that mumbling, you've you must have, you've ever done those tricks where it's not a gasp, it's not a way, it's like mumbling. It's I didn't know that mumbling was the best reaction you could hope for, but you do a trick and you hear that, but then you hear this kind of oh, they're so, how are they doing? and this kind of just murmur that was very hard to then stop and control. Mm -hmm. But ah, oh, the joy that it brought me every single night and obviously I, I mean if you i'm sure most of you know the method and how that is working mm -hmm. but it was a lot of fun a lot of fun to to do that every single night obviously i didn't do anything i was just watching it and talking uh but to be part of that on stage gosh and then to do that on the royal variety show to be able to stand there i did i did i think 15 minutes by myself well me and Bradley Walsh on the Royal Variety show just doing comedy and magic and and recreating that moment mm -hmm. uh with Bradley um I mean yeah it was a very special trick to 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 stand at the Royal Albert Hall to in the West End on the Royal Albert Hall stage performing intro by Darren Brown on the Royal Variety and then doing 50 I did longer than Cher <laughs> like and she had three wigs like it <laughs> it was meant it was mental so that one trick held such a special place in my heart i think the without going into method at all yeah um i think the way that the version that you did in that show was constructed was really clever as well yeah because it took the heat off of you before the heat was ever going to be on you because it wasn't well i if, did I, I didn't i genuinely didn't have to do anything yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's it was just so clever. And what you mentioned about the mumbling, hundred percent. Oh, who it, knew mumbling? It, it, it's amazing because it it means that they've engaged in what you're doing. Oh yeah, They're and, and they just, cared. They don't. They can't. They lose all etiquette and just have to talk about it. It's mm -hmm. great. It's great. The his unbelievable was not smooth sailing. Right, it was it was a lot of hard work, and um, I think we couldn't. I'm sure they won't mind us talking openly about it. That we all have in various places. So, Act Two of the show originally was meant to be a play. It was a recreation of a play called Will the Witch and the Watchman, um, uh, which was a, a 125 year old um, masculine farce. It was the longest running show in the West End at that time, and it had never been seen again on stage. And so we had recreated that play for the first time in 125 years. And that's what we rehearsed for five, six weeks. Act one was a magic show, act two was a play, essentially. A little bit of magic here and there, but a magical farce is what it was. And we had Jim Steinmeier as the, doing the if illusions for the play. It was, it was a lot and, and solid and fun and brilliantly funny and good. And we did it a couple of times and very quickly we realized, I say we, Andrew, Darren, Andy, just realized it doesn't work. It's not because the thing isn't good. It's because it's just, it just doesn't work. Like it's too jarring to watch a magic show and then watch a play and then it, you don't really know what it is. And so all of a sudden we were open. We weren't even... We weren't even, you know, a week away from opening. We were open. The show was open. The audiences were coming. And we had to scrap act two. Six weeks of rehearsals down the drain and go, okay, let's figure this out. So all of a sudden, bit by bit, we were building act two. 
and one of the things that happened was we um they wrote myself and uh sam creasy this end routine uh to finish the show and it involved a couple of things that magically i had never done before and uh and they said well we want to we want to get this done well obviously as much time as you need but also we need a show so i went on stage the next day having learned about 15 pages of script for this whole routine this last wow. section routine because it was basically just me talking for mm. a lot of it was just me talking mm -hmm. and uh went on stage and and that's sort of all right because i can waffle around that that's my happy place but magically there was stuff I was scared of. I was mm. genuinely scared because it would be like saying to someone, uh, I don't really know how, what the comparison is, but um, go and go and do a, a, a finding the aces routine that you have never done before, but do it in front of a thousand people. Mm. And you haven't learned, ever learned how to do that before the day before you're going on to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you know about how to find all those breathers and do all of that sort of stuff. It's It's just go on and do stuff yeah, yeah and so it was it was hard but i was incredibly proud of it and also i would do that in any other i used to do um a, a show called nativity which are the films these christmas films called nativity which i do and we did a live stage version of it and that's improvised so i'd go and out in the Hammersmith Apollo in front of 3,000 people 10 times a week and improvise. It doesn't scare me at all. Wow. So I had to put myself in that mindset of kind of going, okay, well, it's the same with magic. You just got to do it, right? You just got to do it. And if you can if you can preach all of this stuff about misdirection and personality and, and confidence and storytelling being the greatest, you know, you've got to put it into practice. And it, it happened and it worked. So the pride in it and the joy in it um, and that was actually a huge thing for a lot of those routines. I did a, a sort of 25 minute any drink called for uh, by myself, which was really fun to do. But again, a lot of a lot of balls and a lot of a lot of very involved, very involved, very much just being with the spectators, listening mm. and responding. Um, but the day that I turned water into wine, into an Aperol spritz with the same person and they were losing their mind, that was a good day at work. <laughs> that was a good day at work. Just didn't go anywhere near them. Just one into the other, into the other. Wow. And and she was standing there going, it's, it's bubbly now. <laughs> like, yeah, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. There was some joyous moments. But yeah, it, the, the, the changing pocket, it, very special because that kind of sums up the entire experience and mm -hmm. also all of the amazing joyous things that it gave me great choice and that brings us to your last oh. item what's in your last position i'm gonna put this on there because it um yeah it's i i, I would i thought about not doing it but in case i sounded sort of slightly up my own tuchus um Jewish word for bum. I, I'm putting on uh, tricolor. I'm putting on tricolor, which is a, a trick that I brought out uh, a month or two ago with the 1914. Um, because it's my first trick. It's my. It was my. I'd I'd released downloads and I'd released a really small thing um, with Preston Nyman uh, uh, called Six by Six. Um, but this was my first big magic release and I was so proud of it I just oh the day the box to I cried because you know 12 year old me going to Davenport's by myself spending my magic pocket money on things that came in boxes and little bags with instructions and going oh who's that who's that by and buying that thing and that thing and then I had one with my name on it and I just, anyone that's got it, that has ever used it, thank you. If you sold it on a secondhand magic site, good for you. Get your money back. But, like, I was so proud of it. I was just so proud of it. And, yeah, so I think it would be silly not to put it on. And 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 since then, I know Simon Says has come out with Penguin and stuff like that. And it's all very, it will never stop being exciting. But, um 
but that was my first. And you always remember your first, Jamie. <laughs> you always do. Uh, I think it's a phenomenal trick. It's one of those ones as well where the instructions for that effect for tricolor i'm talking up simon for him now um but the the instructions are where the real gold in in that is there's such incredible thinking on there it's so clever it's so diverse there's so many different things that you can do with it it also takes away some of the danger in the effect potentially going wrong with previous methods that existed It, it just cleans everything up perfectly yeah that's what i was sort of aiming for i was aiming for it's essentially non-electronic color match is what it is. Uh, but that's the sort of headline to let you know what it is. But color match is, it, <laughs> it is on the bottom of my list of routines that I would perform with what the gimmicks can do. Um, you can do chair tests and also and drawing duplications and free will plots and all sorts of stuff that just, like I said, I really try and put my money where my mouth is. It is a utility product that allows you to create whatever you can imagine creating with it. And simple, get from A to B in the quickest way possible, in the safest way possible, that is never going to let you down, that allows you to flourish as what is, I believe to be the most magical thing that you can present to someone, which is you. You are the magical thing. Mm -hmm. What you do is a byproduct of what you bring to the table. So... Your card tricks are nothing without you being the sparkly, shiny, magical bit. So, uh, yeah, that's that's what I would take. Very good choice. Uh, again, another really organic one. I think everything on your list, maybe other than the smash and stab, is all very, very organic. Yeah, which absolutely. is great. But I would still do a smash and stab just with bits of envelope, yeah, yeah. envelopes, and <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't do it with anything fancy. And that brings us on to your two curveball items, that being uh, the book and the item, the fact that you can only take one of each of them. Uh, again, you're allowed honourable mentions. There's been very few people that haven't ended up mentioning two or three books. Um, okay. So it's entirely up to you. All right, great. Uh, I am taking... Um, I'm going to take the Dunninger book. Am I taking the Dunninger book or am I taking Larry Becker Stunners? Stunners is such a good book, isn't it? It's such a good book. Syzygy, really good book as well. I think I'm going to take no. I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take the Dunninger book, the Dunninger Encyclopedia. Um, that's the one that I'm taking. It is meant trying to make sense of what's in that book is is. If you've never taken drugs before, don't <laughs> worry about it. Just read the Dunninger book because you look at one page and there's like. If you just take hydrochloric acid and mix it with the pure soul of an infant and then put that in an inkwell, then all of a sudden you'll get the three of clubs. And you're like, uh, I don't know what's going on. And then you turn the page and all of a sudden there's an elephant in a harness. And so you, it's, it's, it's mental. It's mental. Um, but what I love about it, what really excites me, I'm obsessed with very old books, is that there's not a lot going on. There's not... a uh, I know now we we really celebrate nine hours of tutorial and all of that sort of stuff. But this is sort of, you get a bit of a picture and about two paragraphs on sort of is an idea. And what I love is that it very blatantly goes, never tried it, but should work. I sort of love that because it's it spurs so much creativity and thought. Um, during the pandemic, uh, I challenged myself to invent a new magic trick every day and put it on Instagram. And so they were very visual. They weren't mentalism at all. It was all very visual magic. But it was all just reading books like the Dunninger book and old, old, old things and kind of going, okay, well, that's mental. But what about if I took that and that and did that and mixed it with that? Now, all of a sudden, you were co- I was coming up with all these fun new methods to achieve things. And it was all because of books like that. But if I'm ever stuck for like, oh, I don't know, maybe there's something in that. I guarantee if I go to that book, there'll be an answer in there somewhere. Great choice. Also, um, also Larry Becker's Stunners, because as a mentalist, mm-hmm. it is a Bible. Mm-hmm. And Stunners is an older book that hasn't particularly aged in terms of like the the methods are still really fresh and origina- original. Yeah, it's They're amazing. Great. It's a, it's just uh, uh, Larry Becker is 
just a phenomenal, 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 phenomenal thinker. Very smart man. And that brings us on to your curve curve ball. Yeah. Which is your non magic item that you use for magic. Well, Rubik's Cube is the obvious choice, right? Has anyone picked Rubik's Cube? Uh, I can't remember. Okay. I think so. Well, then I should take something different, shouldn't I? Um, it's definitely the hardest thing, and I'm sure listeners listening, if they're, well, in fact, we've seen that people are making up their own lists and posting them on social media. That's at the moment. really fun. So I think everyone has said that this is the most difficult thing. It's a really difficult question because, okay, so logically a Rubik's Cube fits that bill, right? It's a mm-hmm. non magic item that is used for magic, but now it's such a magic item for magicians, isn't it? Um, but also, it's really entertaining. I really enjoy, I solved a Rubik's Cube before I did any magic with a Rubik's Cube. So I, I like just sitting and fiddling around with a Rubik's In fact, at Avenue Q, we used to have a bunch of Rubik's Cubes. Rubik's, Rubi Cube. Rubik's Cubes is, well, yeah, we used to have a bunch of Rubik's uh, Cubes back there. And we would time each other and we'd, be, we'd make up games with solving Rubik's Cubes and stuff right. like that. So, um yeah, then, then, look, then I think it should be a Rubik's cube because that's what I have connection with, and like I hosted the Magic Circle Easter show, I did a Rubik's cube matchup at the beginning Great. of the show. Like mm-hmm. that, I, I'd be li- I'd be making another object up if I didn't use that. So, Rubik cube. I'll let you have that. I think it's a good choice. Thanks. I think it's a really, really good choice. Um, I think lots of people will be with you with that. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people would, would take a Rubik's Cube. Great. What a superb list again. Um, really interesting ones in there. A, a couple of curveballs. Harry Bow, maybe some people might not have heard of. Um, Sterling, I've not heard of. So that'll be one for me to look into. Um, really, really great list. So what is the future? Where can we find out about you? What's to come? So uh, I will be in Chichester. At the Chichester Festival Theatre this summer, playing Fagin in Oliver for Cameron Mackintosh. Uh, And then we come into the West End at the Gilgood Theatre from December. Uh, Magically, there's some really fun stuff going on. Um, Some more tricks in the works coming out with uh, some very fun different companies. Uh, I love creating magic, so that will keep going. Um, And yeah, but otherwise, other than that, my life is Oliver for the for the foreseeable future so what you can't see at the moment is my hair is now mentally big and i'm having to grow up my beard and i've just got my ears pierced so basically what i'm trying to say is my mother's proud of me (laughs) so uh if you too want to be like my mother and be proud of me then come see me and oliver and let me know that my life choices haven't all been for nothing okay i still stand by the conceit this podcast is absolutely flawed I'm taking tricks. It, the, the, it, we, I get it. You listened to Desert Island Dish. You thought it'd be a great idea, but that you're listening to that. I'm choosing this. I'm choosing what kind of fool am I by Sammy Davis Jr. And then I get to listen to what kind of fool am I. It makes me happy because I'm alone on a desert island. Now, here's what's happened. I'm now on a desert island. And rather than having music to listen to, films to watch, and or food or friends, <laughs> right? That should be a question. Who are you taking with you to show you the tricks to? Because you haven't put that in. So now, all of a sudden, I'm stuck on a desert island with a floppy wallet, <laughs> some Haribo, which I'm going to eat in day one because <laughs> I'm going to be sugar craving. I've got some coins from a card trick. I've got a spike through my hand because my smash and stab's <laughs> gone wrong. But I've got a Rubik's Cube, so I'll be entertained. Nice. See? It works. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Stick with it. <laughs> Uh, on that note thank you very much don't forget Simon has also got a creators page on Unlimited so if you're an Unlimited member go on there his um, studio live lecture will be on there at the time of you listening Um, we've not actually although I'm going to break the concept of the the podcast here um, at the point of recording we're actually going to record that tonight but Simon actually came down and showed myself and Harry the routines that he's going to be teaching maybe like four four or five weeks ago, and genuinely, all of them phenomenal. So please do. And if Simon ever lectures in the future, which hopefully he will do, and he'll go to local clubs, I highly recommend you checking out uh, his items. As well as that, he's actually filmed for us an entire acting course, which, again, me and Harry were talking for weeks after we filmed it about some of the ideas and thoughts in it, especially 
Simon actually touched on some of it in this podcast um, that he spoke about. It's really, really good. So please check that out on there. Thank you, Simon, for recording it for a second time. Um, but it was very good. I regret it. <laughs> and thank you guys for listening. We will speak to you again soon with another episode of Desert Island Tricks. Goodbye. Goodbye now. Hi, Peter Nardi here, and I really hope you enjoyed that podcast. I just wanted to make you know that Alakazam have their own app. You can download it from the App Store or the Google Play Store. By downloading the app, it will make your shopping experience even slicker at Alakazam. You'll also get exclusive in-app offers and in-app live streams. So go download it now, and we'll see you on the next podcast.